a time that you've set apart to study it, Lord, that we could look into the scriptures, that we could search and always see you in them, Lord, that that as you said that all the scriptures point to you, they speak of you, Lord, and uh, so whether it's uh, Old Testament or New Testament, Lord, that we can just come to know you more and get closer and closer to you and building that relationship with you through your word, Lord. So, Father, as we come into this time, we just lift it up to you, and we thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Greet one another and be seated. (laughs) Hey, Carl. All right. Hello, all you beautiful people of God. What's amazing to me is I I was just really blessed by the singing. Yes. And uh, I'm telling you, just singing with you guys back there in the middle of the song, my tooth stopped hurting and everything started just, I mean, I am feeling nothing right now. So, you know, either I'm going to collapse up here in front of you guys or the Lord did something. So let's go with the Lord. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, we are not having communion tonight. Hopefully you realize that uh, because I put the wrong stuff on the announcements again. Um, we do, however, have U-Turn for Christ here this Friday night. Woo. So you can come out and, um, you know, you can always bug uh, um, Mr. Marco from the uh, sanctuary about what's going on at U-Turn. And he often shares what's happening out there and you know, just his, his heart as he's doing it. It's just beautiful stuff. Tell you guys, you need to be here. Um, let's see. Uh, offerings, you guys know we don't pass out a plate. There's boxes on the back and uh, on the back walls. And uh, give as the Lord sees fit um, or puts in your heart. Uh, it's, a, it's another form of worship to him. Um, VBS signups are still going on. There's little cards back there. Take them and give them to people that have kids. Just because you don't have a kid doesn't mean that they might not want to send their kid um, or bring their child here. Uh, It'll be in the evenings, too. So if you want to help or there's something you can do, it's from 6 to 8.30. Uh, And, and again, everything's back there in the back, all the information and everything, and they can sign up online. Um, And they have to sign up ahead of time. We can't, you know, if they walk in, you know, we're going to have limited space. So, um And I do believe that that is it. Yes, though, maybe so. All right. Always got to throw it out there because there might be something else going on. So it's a little warm in here to me. But I am fluffy. So let's move on. Uh, Pray with me, if you would, over Leviticus chapter 3. Father, as we come to you right now, Lord, we thank you so much for your word, so much for... Uh, Lord, just how it moves upon us and how when we read it, sometimes Lord, we read it and we just can't understand it. We can't grasp it. Uh, we can't even begin to comprehend it at times. And and so many times, Lord, as you move along, move us along in our faith, as we come to understand you, uh, as we come to see what it is that you're doing, um, not just here uh, with the Israelites in Leviticus, but what you mean to do in us as we look at this. Um, that, Father, that these sacrifices apply to us as much as they did to Israel. And help us to see that connection tonight and to understand it, Lord. And uh, we just thank you so much for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Leviticus chapter 3, and as you're turning there, you know, um, one of the things that we need to remember as we're kind of going through this, um, for me, it's this awesome thing of, what the book of Leviticus means. Now, we're not going through it in detail. We're just doing an overview of it. But still, even in looking at this, the book of Leviticus is one of those books, uh, you know, it's, it's in, the, in, the, in the Torah, right? It's the, uh, it's the middle book of the Torah. It's that, you know, there's um, Genesis and Exodus on one side, right? And Deuteronomy and Numbers on the other side. And it is... As it is in the middle of the book, it's it's a book that demands to be understood. It's the book that demands to be seen. Um, a, as we look at this, you know, in, in chapters 1 and 2, we saw the burnt offering, a free will offering, right? Um, and it talked about how the, that bull um, or that offering would be an atonement for the offerer. 
And do you remember who brought the offering? The, the individual, right? You brought that offering to them. And remember, did they inspect the individual or the, did they inspect the offering? The offering, right? So uh, they brought it from the livestock, the herd, the flock. Um, and then we saw the second of the free will offering when we looked at the grain offering. And, you know, that's like an homage of thanksgiving, of, um, you know, thanking God for the production and the things that he's done. It's, it's kind of like, you know, because a lot of times we earn something or do something and we give ourselves, you know, we pat ourselves on the back really good, you know. Oh, man, I just got all this. I got this great job. I got this great, you know, I, I think I've earned, you know, X, Y, or Z, whatever it is. Um, but with this offering, it's a reminder that it, even the, though I may have produced that with my hands, it was God that made everything possible. You know, it, it's like if we came to God and said, well, God, I did this. And he says, OK, well, here's what I'm going to do. You go make some air, a planet and some trees. And when you're done, then you can say you did it kind of thing. Right. So they're bringing that grain offering to God and, and thanking God for what he has produced and what he has done, because. You know, as much as we seed clouds, we still can't make it rain. Um, and it, remember, he talked about there was to be no leaven and no honey in any of it. So a lot of times we bring God our offerings and we bring him our things and we corrupt it. Right. And that honey, that leaven, it is corruption. It causes fermentation. And that's, you know, one of the reasons we talked about why no honey would be in it. Um, because, you know, it, it, many, much of that stuff is sweet by itself. Um, and, and salt was to be included, and that was that symbol of permanence, loyalty, preservation. And now we come to the third free will offering, the peace offering in Leviticus chapter 3. It's also known as the fellowship offering. Some of your Bibles may say fellowship offering. Some may say peace offering. But, and this is a free will offering. This is, you know, when his offering is a sacrifice, of peace offering if he offers it of the herd whether male or female so there's no definition now um, or no no requirement of being male or female he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord and as we get into that you know does that have that significance that we talked about when you know uh, I mistakenly called a heifer a male right uh, and I was called out by the West Texas uh, uh, trio there and um, but here's the thing uh, that word, we talked about that, what it can mean, what it can't mean. But the fact is, is that there was no set in stone thing at this time. And with this, the sacrifice of peace offering. And there's a few times we also see where a female, you know, animal is used for sacrifices. Like when David goes to make an offering, you know, in repentance for a sin that he did, he actually used a female. Um, so, you know, and, and there's times where it's used and where it's done. But, the, but here... You know, he actually says neither male nor female. Um, and, and But there is one specific thing here that is mentioned about it. And what is that? That it is without what? Blemish, right? So that means you don't bring me your secondhand stuff. You bring me the best, okay? Right? Not me personally, but God, okay? Um, and that's one of the things that we look at when you're going to – we're going to see later in Leviticus 7.29 – he says, he who offers a sacrifice of his peace offering to the Lord shall bring this offering to the Lord from the sacrifice of his peace offering. So, you know, it, the whole idea is you're bringing it. You're bringing the offering. Um, and he shall let, verse 2, he shall lay his head, hand on the head of his offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood around the altar. Who is the he that cuts the, cuts the animal? It is the he that brings it. And that's something that you and I kind of got to keep that in mind as we do this. God's not asking you, you know, he doesn't want somebody to stand in your place. I cannot come to Jesus for you. Your mom cannot come to Jesus for you. Nobody can be God for you. You have to come to him. It has to be a personal thing. It has to be a sacrifice that you that is made to him. And we know that because of that, you know, that that laying the hand on the head. It's that transference. It doesn't just mean. You know, it's the idea of pressing into it. You're pushing into it. And it's, the, it's that, you know, you're representing me before God. And he's, he's pushing on the head of that animal. And he is, you represent me. And then that animal goes before God. And we talked about that, that, that innocent blood that has to cover us 
to be able to come to God in that fashion. Verse 3, he shall, and I'm going to stop doing this every other verse, okay? We're, good, we're, good, we're getting through this. Then he shall offer from the sacrifices of the peace offering, an offering made by fire to the Lord. The fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails, two kidneys, the fat that is on them by the flanks, and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys, he shall remove. And Aaron's son shall burn it upon the altar of burnt sacrifice, which is the wood that is on the fire as an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. If his offering as a sacrifice of peace offering to the Lord uh, of the Lord is, is of the flock, whether male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. If he offers a lamb as his offering, then he shall offer it before the Lord, and he shall lay his hand on the hand of his offering and kill it before the tabernacle of meeting. And Aaron's son shall sprinkle his blood all around the altar. Then he shall offer from the sacrifice of the peace offering as an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is fat, its fat and whole fat tail, which he shall remove close to the backbone. Now, some people have even said that that removing close to the backbone is the way they would flay it would be very similar to how Christ would have been beaten, you know, because of the way that they would tear from the backbone and, and cut from the backbone. And some have even compared that to the uh, scourging of Christ before he was crucified. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily like that, but I kind of want you guys to, to see and know and understand that because... If that's an equation and, and, and something that represents it, then so should the, you know, the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails, the two kidneys and the fat that is on them by the flanks and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys, he shall remove and the priest shall burn them on the altar as food and offering made by fire to the Lord. So it says the priest is going to burn them as food as well. So he's, he's going to burn part of it. And then they're going to eat part of it. So it's a barbecue again, right? So they're coming before the Lord, and, and they're going to share in this. But the priests are going to take part in this. Um, and, and you and I, we sit there, and we hear that fat, 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 fat. And we're just like, what? Really? Um, because if you've ever really cooked brisket or anything like that, you know, it's really best when you cook it where the fat actually kind of drains into the meat over a long period of time. Man, it turns that meat into something special. Right? Yeah, I, can, I can feel my heart slowing down just thinking about it. Right? Um, but I brought a picture for you. If you could put that picture up of a sheep. Because this is a delicacy in, in many of the Asian countries and in many. Yeah, there you go. That is a fat tail sheep. You know, all this back here, that's all fat. And they, they bred them like that even during this time because that was the best part. It is a delicacy you understand it is the sweetness it's what makes the meat sweet really really lean meat how many of you know is really not tasty super lean meat is just not tasty if it ain't got fat in it it ain't meat right you can take that down because everybody's just going to be going ooh, because we've never had it we don't understand it but here's the thing um that was considered special to them and that was the thing that he wanted. I want the part that's sweet. I want the part that makes everything good. I want the part, you know, that, that, that gives flavor. I want the inward parts, you know, all these kidneys, the entrails, the, the fatty lobes on the livers even. All that inward part belongs to me, the Lord says. And it goes up to him as a sweet aroma. And, and he receives it from us. Not, again, because of us, but because of the sacrifice that was brought, because it was pure, it was unblemished. He says, you shall neither eat fat nor blood. And, and you know, again, the prohibition of eating fat was good from Israel from the standpoint um, because, you know, some people think because of blood cholesterol and heart disease and things like that. Um, but it is especially good with the from the blood aspect because, much of the blood is, you know, if you eat raw meat and stuff like that, you get tapeworms. And I was going to bring you a picture of a man in China that had eaten a lot of sashimi, and his body was literally riddled with tapeworms. It was almost every internal organ that he had. Uh, he had, you don't want to see it? Okay, well, we won't do that then. Um, but the whole idea in obeying this command uh, it, it, it would help them to avoid these, these dangerous parasites by draining the blood from the meat, as it were. Um, 
Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about cholesterol and stuff like that. Uh, but blood cholesterol is a little bit different. Um, you know, and, and anyway, we'll look at these things later. If his offering is a goat, he shall offer it before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on his head, kill it before the tabernacle of meeting. And the sons of Aaron shall sprinkle his blood all around the altar. Then he shall offer from it his offering, an offering made by fire to the Lord, the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails, the two kidneys, the fat that is on them by the flanks and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys, he shall remove. And these guys are wearing white. And you got to believe, you know, when they come home and, honey, I brought my work uniform home, right? That's not going to, that's going to be a special moment in that house. You know what I'm saying? Not white anymore, yeah. And the priest shall burn them on the altar as food, verse 16, and an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma. All the fat is the Lord's. This shall be a perpetual statute through your generations and all your dwellings. You shall neither eat fat nor blood. Now, many take that as an extension of you shall neither eat fat nor blood ever. Um, but it's not. He is specifically talking about of the sacrifice that is given. There is going to be a command that is given later on where he specifically says, you don't eat blood. And that's completely different from this, okay? Um, and that's talking about at all. But never is a command given for them not to eat fat. So, you know, they bred the sheep for purpose and reason, you know, because they wanted to eat like that. Um, you know, and again, as we come to this later uh, about, the you know, not eating strangled meat and stuff like that, and we even see that. In Acts, when, you know, when they come to James and they're like, hey, what do we tell all these Gentile Christians? And he says, well, tell them not to eat anything, you know, with blood, you know, or sacrifice to idols and, you know, stop doing all that sex and stuff. And we're good. And, uh, you know, so anyway, that's a little conversation that um, happens there. Uh, and, and in Leviticus 17, 10 through 12, we're going to see where it talks about not eating strangled flesh, right? Uh, or not eating strangled meat. And, um, but even as we look at all these sacrifices and all these things, and you know, in this peace offering that is being made with this unblemished sacrifice, it, it, one of the things is you and I have to remember, when was Jesus Christ crucified? According to the Scriptures, before the foundation of the world. God himself is timeless. God does not... You know, he sees the end from the beginning. Everything happens at once. Remember, we talked about this when Moses actually went on a mountain. He's looking and he's ex and he is seeing the sacrifice. He is seeing what Jesus Christ did. He sees all these things happen and, and all these things happen at once. Um, Moses is, is fellowshipping and sees the the exact layout of the tabernacle and how everything is supposed to go. And then he does it. Um, and. Everything we see here, every sacrifice, you know, the millions and millions of animals that are going to die here. It's a shadow, a small shadow of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. Romans chapter five, verses one through two says, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, so the same sacrifice of peace offering that they made. We have that made for us. When it says that this is an eternal thing, when he says you're going to do this for, throughout the ages, it is done in Jesus Christ. Because a lot of people say, you know, they can't do these anymore. And that's true. They can't make these sacrifices anymore. They can't have that peace with God in this respect because it is done already in Jesus Christ. Verse 2 of Romans chapter 5 says, Through whom we also have access by faith into this grace, in which we stand and rejoice in the hope and glory of God. Jesus Christ is our peace, guys. He is our peace offering. Isaiah 53, 5, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. And that is Him. Ephesians 2, 14, He Himself is our peace. And when he says that, he literally means Jesus himself is our peace. He's our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. And that's that wall in the tabernacle between the holy and the holy of holies. Guys, he's crossed that barrier for us. We no longer have to go. I, I, I don't have to go and, and slaughter a lamb anymore. 
to stand in my place because Jesus Christ, the perfect, unblemished Lamb of God, has done it. And that's the same thing. In this peace that you and I walk in, we have to understand because a lot of times when we get in our flesh, when we start walking in our world, we start walking for ourselves, we start walking in selfishness or looking for things of our own glory, we can't experience that peace because we're trying to do things ourselves. And I'm gauging my peace by my circumstances. Do I have this? Do I have that? You know, what do I need to have peace? And he says, he himself, Jesus, is our peace. You see, that's where we come into that perfect, peaceful relationship with God. Because the perfect sacrifice has been made. And I know and understand and you know and understand that our peace with him is found in Jesus. Not in what we do. Right? Not in what we do. But yet what we do will affect it. And we'll talk about that later. Leviticus chapter 4 verse 1. And we're cranking. Okay, we're doing this. Uh, Now the Lord will see, right? Uh, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a person sins unintentionally against any of the commandments of the Lord in anything which ought not to be done, and does any of them, if the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt upon the people, then let him offer to the Lord for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bull without blemish, as a sin offering. Okay, wow. So you've got to stop there, because one of the things that happens, you know, that it says here is that what happens when the priest sins? He brings guilt on who? The people. Because the priest, as he is, he is a representative for God. What does the priest carry on his breastplate? He carries the tribes of Israel, right? He carries all those stones that represent each tribe. He carries the glory of God on his head. He is a very representative. And if he sins, it's a huge deal. Remember, we talked about a bull, right? A bull is like the John Deere tractor. You're you're sacrificing a tractor when you do this. It's a huge deal. Um, And, you know, we read this and we read that unintentionally. And we go, well, man, I've, I've intended to do some sins. So can I not be forgiven? Is there no sacrifice for me? You know, you and I have to understand one of the things that God is talking about here, and he reveals it in the scriptures, and he shows us time and time again where people would, you know, it's not, you know, they plot, they plan, they do things, but for the most part, many people do sin unintentionally. Many of us do. There are intentional sins, and that's something we can get into in in a little bit. Um, But for the most part, for most people, they're not really thinking of, I'm going to commit this sin when I do this. They're thinking of completely other things. You know, uh, for many of the people of Israel, they didn't have their own Bible. They didn't carry a Bible around like you or I. Most of us have it on our phones. We've probably got like 17 different versions on our phones. You know what I'm saying? You know, they didn't have that. So many of the times when they're committing sins unintentionally, it's the idea that they don't even know what they're doing is wrong until somebody says, that's wrong. you got sacrifices to make, right? But with the priest, it doesn't give him that out. Um, you know, what are some of the what are some of the sins for which there is absolutely no sacrifice that we know, you know, right off the top of your head in the scriptures? Adultery, right? Because adultery, if you were caught in the middle of adultery, the sentence was death. Period. There was no there was no sacrifice that you could make for it. And another one was murder. If you committed murder, that was it. You were done. Um, and who do we know that committed both? Y'all know who it is. Who committed adultery and murder? David, right? David did this, and, and if you were to read Psalm chapter 32, verses 1 through 5, or actually Psalm 32 and, and some of the other psalms in the scriptures, he's in his own personal hell when he does this. Because he knows himself that there is no sacrifice for this there is no sacrifice for this sin in, in in psalm 32 he says how blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered how blessed is the person against whom the lord does not charge iniquity and who, in whose spirit there is no deceit david confesses in verse 3 when i kept silent about my sin my body wasted away by groaning all day long. Isaiah says, he is at perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. 
uh, we know from the other scriptures that to walk in the ways, uh, what is it, Jeremiah, uh, uh, Jeremiah, I think, um, is it 114 or 14, 6, says, you know, when you walk in his statutes, when you walk in his ways, you experience peace, right? Um, but here, David has no peace. He's tormented because there is no forgiveness for this sin. Uh, when I kept silent about it, my body wasted away by groaning all day long, for your hand was heavy upon me day and night, because he knew that, that it was death. My strength was exhausted as in a summer drought. My sin, he says in verse 5, I acknowledge to you. My iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. There was absolutely no sacrifice for it. The only sacrifice was in David's heart, giving it to the Lord, confessing his sin before him, and then experienced forgiveness from him. And for many of us, we've done these things. And like David, we can come and we can confess our transgressions and experience that forgiveness of sin. James 5.16, confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We use that like it's a, you know, hey, I can just pray and, you know, I'm, I'm going to get that Mercedes Benz I've been wanting, right? That's not the context of what he's praying. He's saying, you know, if you confess your sins to one another, you're going to experience this healing from God. Because if I confess a sin to you, the devil can't accuse me. The devil can't come after me. The devil can't do anything to me. Because now I've placed it in your hands. I've sacrificed it to God. I've confessed it. He has no power anymore. Because you and I are walking in perfect fellowship. Because I have said, Jesus Christ paid for this, brother. Help me. Help me give it to him. And that's something that we're going to look at here. Because we see not just the imperfection of the high priest, but later we're going to see even the nation itself and the leaders itself are represented in this. But in this, and, and one of the things that we see here, and it's funny because somebody called me and actually gave me the scripture as something God was pressing upon them for what was going on in their life. And I was like, you know, that's awesome, Lord, how you just bring these scriptures. But with this leader, with this priest that comes, in the guilt of his that, that is placed upon the nation as it was, every high priest, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1 through 4 says, every high priest selected from a man, among men is appointed to officiate on their behalf in matters relating to God, that is, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can deal gently with people who are ignorant and easily deceived since he himself is subject to weakness. And see, that's one of the things that the Bible tells us to be careful about how we approach others, to be careful in how we contend with each other because pride comes before the fall. You know, you want to be there to lift a brother up because next thing you know, he's going to be putting his hand down to you, right? Verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 5 says, For that reason he is obligated to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for those of the people. So the priest, when he is sacrificing this bull because of his personal sin, he is even then standing before the people to offer this. Verse 4, no one takes this honor upon himself, but he is called to it by God just as Aaron was. And that's, and of course, as we see later on in Hebrews, he's talking about Jesus Christ. Okay? But all of these things and any of these things, whether it be as a pastor, as a ministry leader, as a servant, you know, you represent. And, and this is one of the reasons I think the world kind of forgets and they think all oh, Christians are so judgy is because when we are up here, we are walking in an area where we have to meet certain qualifications to remain in this ministry. And. You know, I can stumble, I can fall, I can sin, but there are certain things in the Bible that is clearly said for me to perform or do these things is to disqualify myself from ministry. It doesn't mean I have to leave the church. You know, if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me my sin, right? There's a sacrifice for my sin already made, but I've now disqualified myself from ministry. It doesn't mean I get kicked out of the church. It just means I don't stand up here anymore. 
It doesn't matter how gifted someone may be. He may be the most perfect teacher you've ever heard. You hear him, and you know, oh, after 15 minutes of him teaching, I cry, Pastor, you don't understand. I'm sorry, the man has disqualified himself from being in service. You know? Or the worship leader has, or the, the minister has, or the counselor has, or, you know, ad, ad infinitum ad nauseum, right? The whole idea is when you, when you stand in a place of authority where you are representing the Word of God, you have to understand you've placed yourself under, under watchful eye. You place yourself under the scrutiny and, and you stand there and you're representing him, not just to the world, but to the body and, and, and the people itself. Verse 4 of chapter 4. Verse 4 of chapter 4. He shall bring the bull to the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, lay his hand. Again, that lay is to lay into, to press into, transferring, you know, on the bull's head and kill the bull before the Lord. Then the anointed priest shall take some of the... Now, really quick, I think it's in... Don't turn there. But just a reminder, I think in 1 Kings chapter 8. I think it's 1 Kings chapter 8. If you want to turn there when you get a chance later on or something like that. And you see when Solomon came to the temple. I want to say he killed like 22,000 bulls. So that's 22,000 tractors. You know? That's a lot of money, dude. Um, but, you know, here he, you know, he's on the bull's head to kill a bull before the Lord. Then the anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood. I mean, literally, this huge beast, this thing. And he takes some of the blood, right? But where does he go with it? The anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of meeting. So he's changed up this, the location. He shall sprinkle some of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary. So he goes in not to the Holy of Holies, but before the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord. So that which is lifting up the prayers, that which represents the prayers of Israel, right? Going up to the Lord, the priest comes in and places some of the blood on each one of the horns of the incense altar. May this rise up to the Lord. May, may this sin be covered. May this thing be done. He shall take from it um, all the fat of the bull as a sin offering, the fat that covers the entrails, all the fat which is on the entrails, the two kidneys, the fat that is on them by the flanks and the fatty lobe, attached to the liver above the kidneys he shall remove. And as he was taken from the bull, the sacrifice of the peace offering, and the priest shall burn on the altar, of, uh, burn them on the altar of burnt offering. Um, you know, just to kind of think there for a moment, the fat, the blood belong to the Lord again. Um, and you, can, you can't remove all of it. You just can't. You can't remove all the blood from me, and you can't remove all the fat from the meat. But they did as much as they could. You know, and, and that's the thing when they're doing this. It's not just bringing a bull, killing it, and sacrificing it. It's the preparation of it. It's the parts that are sacrificed. It's the things that are given. And I know that, you know, as we talked about earlier, that some say that, you know, removing of the fat is all about, you know, you know, protecting them from cholesterol and heart disease. Well, if that were the case, God rethought that in Acts chapter 10, right? Am I right? You guys remember what happened in Acts chapter 10? Um, Peter was sitting there praying. He had a trance. Heaven opened up. Great sheep bound from former corners. All kinds of four-footed animals on the earth. Wild beasts, creeping things, birds of the air. The voice said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And said a second time, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. And basically said, get chowing, buddy. There's no more sacrifice. Jesus is it. Eat it all. So, and the fact that there would be no more sacrifice would mean a whole lot more fat put into the diet. So, I, I really don't, I, I don't see it as, you know, God's new diet plan for the ages. Um, just, just eat right. You know, don't eat like me. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, so I, if we were truly, if this was supposed to be some kind of newfangled diet that we were supposed to follow, I think he would make it very plain and, and, and make that statement, but he doesn't. Um, so let's not go there with that. Uh, though we do know some things are bad for us, in another five years they'll be great for us. So let's move on. Um, 
Verse 11, the bull's hide and all its flesh with its head and legs, its entrails and offal. The whole bull he shall carry outside the camp to a clean place where the ashes are poured and burn it on wood with fire where the ashes are poured out and shall be burned. There shall not be a single thing left. And, you know, it's like, again, we can see parallels. We can see shadows. And some of them may be a reach and speculation. But what other sacrifice do we know of that was carried outside of the city gates? Jesus. That's right. Jesus, who was sacrificed for us, was, yes, that's right. And he was carried outside of the city gates. Yes, ma'am. Now, if the whole congregation, verse 13, of Israel sins unintentionally and the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done something against any of the commandments of the Lord and anything which should not be done and are guilty, then the sin which they have committed becomes known. Then the assembly shall offer a young bull for the sin and bring it before the tabernacle of meeting. Don't you hope our country wakes up like that? Lord, make it known. Verse 15, and the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands on the head of the bull before the offer. Before before the Lord, then the bull shall be killed. But then the bull shall be killed before the Lord. The anointed priest shall bring some of the bull's blood to the tabernacle of meeting. The priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord in front of the veil. And he shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar, which is before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall pour the remaining blood at the base of the altar of burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. He shall make all the fat from it and burn it on the altar. And he shall do with the bull as he did with the bull as a sin offering. So the same thing he did there, he's going to do now. Because this is a sin offering. It's just for the entire nation. Thus he shall do with it. So the priest shall make atonement for them. And it shall be forgiven them. And he shall carry the bull outside the camp and burn it as he burned the first, the first bull. It is a sin offering for the assembly. So all that. To, as a reminder and kind of, you know, sum it up, basically no one, no one individual or even on a national basis is immune from sin. And at, on a national basis, we see Israel judged many times as a nation, and then we see individual ju- individuals judged, you know, as individuals. And as this is a voluntary offering, this is, you know, it, it's brought to the Lord for their sin Uh, and just as we were to be at peace earlier this is a coming to the lord to you know to reconcile with him where we're at that word atonement in the hebrew is kapar or or kapar to to cover atone propitiate or pacify it's also used to smear over in uh the book of genesis when they you know uh, when they made the ark okay they smeared pitch into it. That's the same word. They atoned it, right? They, they, they covered it. They covered all the cracks and crevices with pitch. In uh, the book of Exodus, the ark that Moses was placed into was atoned with pitch to keep it from leaking and to keep it whole. Um, but it also means to smear. Uh, and the whole idea of that, to smear, is where we know we're, we're told that, you know, God has wiped out our debt, right? Um, 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19 says, You know that it was not with perishable things like silver or gold that you've been ransomed from the worthless way of life, handed down to you by your ancestors, but with the precious blood of the Messiah, like that of a lamb without blemish or defect. Um, the ransom that he has paid, the debt that he has paid for us, to erase is smeared over. It is atoned. It is covered by that blood. Whether it's a, and again, it's amazing that they can do this, that this specific thing can cover this, and then the sacrifice of Christ is equal to billions and billions and billions and goes on and on and on throughout eternity. Verse 22, when a ruler has sinned and done something unintentionally, and we talked about this earlier, about the rulers, you know, being being held accountable too. It doesn't matter. You can't say, hey, I was just doing it for the country. I was just following orders. No, buddy. When a ruler has sinned and done something unintentionally against any of the commandments of the Lord, his God, and anything which should not be done, and is guilty, or if his sin which he has committed comes to his knowledge, he shall bring as an offering a kid of the goats, a male without blemish, 
and he shall lay his hand on the head of the goat and kill it at the place where they kill the burnt offering before the Lord. It is a sin offering. The priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger, put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering, and pour its blood at the base of the altar of burnt offering. And he shall burn all its fat on the altar, like the fat of the sacrifice of the peace offering. So the priest shall make atonement, again, covering uh, for him concerning his sin, and it shall be forgiven him. If any one of the common people sins unintentionally by doing something against any one of the commandments of the Lord and anything which is not done and is, and is guilty, or if his sin which he has committed comes to knowledge, and he shall bring as an offering a kid of the goats, a female without blemish. So this is just any guy, you know. Oh, man, I blew it again, I, you know. I, I just yelled at my wife. I just, you know, yelled at my kids. I just, you know, I gotta go get another goat. Ah, you know, he, he, or some turtle doves, things like that. But we'll talk about that later. Uh, for his sin which he has committed, he shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering, kill the sin offering of the place of the burnt offering. The priest shall take some of its blood with his fingers. He does the same thing. Uh, verse 31, he shall remove all its fat. His fat is removed from the sacrifice of the peace offering. And again, verse 31, the priest shall make atonement for him and it shall be forgiven him. The thing that we need to see is not the cost of sacrifice of animals, which is required to cover sin because innocent blood must be shed for it. But the fact that the moment that it is done, it is forgiven him. Verse 32, if he brings a lamb as a sin offering, he shall bring a female without blemish. He shall lay his hand on his head of the sin offering, kill it as a sin offering at the place where they kill the burnt offering. The priest shall take some of the blood of his offering with his sin, put it on the horns of the altar burnt offering, pour all the remaining blood at the base of the altar. He shall remove all its fat as the fat of the lamb is removed from the sacrifice of peace offering. Then the priest shall burn it on the altar according to the offerings made by fire to the Lord so that the priest shall make atonement. The priest isn't atoning. The blood is atoning. But the priest is performing the action for his sin that he has committed and it shall be forgiven him. So, and as we talked about, um, we're going to see many of these things repeated later. We will. I will not read the whole things when we get there. Much of it, we're, we'll just touch on some of the details where there's differences and stuff like that. Because that's a lot of stuff, right? And um, again, since we're not Hebrews, we're not into repetition a whole lot, right? Unless it's like one of our favorite TV shows. And then they change it slightly from show to show, right? Um, but as we look at it, our sacrifice is him. Again, you know, blood, blood, sacrifice, sacrifice, and fat, fat, fat. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Every time you hear something being slaughtered, every time you hear something being killed, you and I need to think Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He came as a sacrifice for you and I. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26 says, Now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed. This, this is his sacrifice for you and I. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The very thing we're reading, he says, it is a testimony of what Jesus has done for you. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Whether you're a Jew, whether you're a Greek, no matter who you are, you have sinned. And you have fallen short. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. I've been justified freely because of what he did. Whom God set forth, he says, as a propitiation. That propitiation is to pay that price. He, that, he was that stand in for you and I. You know, and, and it's mind blowing that God set forth as a propitiation to satisfy the debt to God. Because God he cannot suffer sin to be in his presence. And Christ was the propitiation to be able to place us before him in fellowship with our God. Through, you know, by his blood, he says, through faith, you know, and his blood did what? It was it atoned for us. It was smeared for us. Through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You cannot 
and even if they rebuilt the temple tomorrow, and we know that that's going to be a precursor to some crazy things right around the corner, right? But even if they build it tomorrow, those sacrifices mean nothing. They are ineffectual because it, he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. There is no more sacrifice. It is done. When Jesus got on the cross, he said, it is finished. There is no more. The fat, the richness of the blood, the life in the blood is the Lord's. That was life, you know, and, and anything of the sacrifice, it belongs to him. The deepest things are his. The Bible calls you and I to make sacrifices of ourself, does it not? You know, I would encourage you just go and look at all the different places in the New Testament. OK, where he talks about you and I being sacrifices. And if he says, I want you to pull from the most inward parts and that's the sacrifice for me. You guys eat the barbecue. I want the inside stuff. You and I have within us, much of us will hide our sins, we'll put our hurt deep down, we'll take these things. And Christ says, I want you to make your bodies a living sacrifice to me. I want you to give me your inward parts, your inward hurts. Everything that's keeping you from me, I want it. I want the deepest of it. You know, he, he wants sacrifices from us still, but not cutting a lamb's throat or killing a bull. That's almost easier. I can cut that and I'm done. But now he's saying, I want you to yank your guts out and give them to me. Right? It says we are to make our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. A living sacrifice. I'm supposed to get up on the altar alive. Right? And you and I have to understand, you know, because... It's so easy to play the Christian game and to pretend like we're so righteous and to say I follow rules and can't believe that guy's not following the rules because I'm following the rules. And when I follow the rules, when I do these things, I can be just like the Proverbs 7 woman, right? This Proverbs 7 woman reminds us that because what does the Proverbs 7 woman do? She stands out in the street and she's prostituting herself to the young men. And she says, it's okay, I'm just like you. I made my peace offering. I've made my vows to the Lord. So we're good now. We can do this. We can sin together and be okay with God. That's the world. That's, a, that's, that's looking at the sacrifice and the things that God has done to free us to do whatever we want when that is exactly the opposite of what he has done. There is nothing in the scriptures that even remotely says, you know, Christ died so you can, you know, so you can work for that weekend like everybody else, you know, but really enjoy it guilt-free. That's not what God is about. He wants us to offer a sacrifice of praise like we heard earlier tonight. He, he wants you to sing with such abandon that we would all be like our sister was tonight. Not caring about what anybody thinks, what anybody says, what anybody does. But most of us hold on because we don't want to appear prideful or we don't want to just let it go, man. Worship God. Be caught up in Him. Our bodies, are, He wants us to give our life. I have been crucified with Christ, right? Man, we're living, living sacrifices to him. And, I, and as we look at this, the whole thing, you know, and, and we are going to get, as we get into this, we are going to get into where we begin to see about how he talks about living life and doing these things and, and the moral laws and things like that. But, you know, even then I want to be, car be careful about calling it moral law because much of it is simply moral statements that are made. You know, it's not even law. Because a lot of times, you know, we'll tell somebody, hey, man, you really shouldn't be living like that. And they'll say, I'm not under the law. I'm not talking about the law. I'm talking about morality. Right? I'm talking about right and wrong. That's, that's scriptural. And that's something that you and I need to get into. But even when we do that, we also have to remember, like he talked about that high priest, where you and I, right, are just as weak as anybody else. And when I approach that person, when I do that thing, I want to approach in that way and go, 
yeah, I want to bring you back because I might be next. And I want you to bring me back. We don't want to corrupt people by twisting the word of God and doing these things. But we also don't want to use it to beat them over the head because they have a perfect sacrifice in Jesus Christ. And if we lift him up, if we bring him before them, then he'll be everything they need. Let's pray. Father, uh, we just thank you so much just for your word, just for every sacrifice we see, every bit of blood, everything that, that we see come across here, Lord, is all pointing to you. And Father, I just thank you for each and every person here, and I pray that as we look at these things that we would not be, uh, Father, too grossed out, um, but that we would look at it for what it truly is. That he is wanting us to take part in this sacrifice. Father, Jesus says that, uh, Lord, he says, eat my body, drink my blood. He says, you take part in me completely and wholly. And Father, as we take part in this sacrifice of him, we die to our flesh, we die to ourselves, and we come to life. And we truly begin to experience what life is by being set free from sin, free from the world. Not so that we can go sin, but to be free from it. And I pray that each and every one of us, Lord, would just be caught up in you uh, to not find our peace in anything but you, knowing that the perfect peace offering has been made. So we have peace with our God, and you want to have fellowship with us. You love us so much. And I thank you for each and every person here, Lord. And I, I just uh, so blessed by them. And I uh, just lift them up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So... Um, so I said I would pick somebody each time, each Wednesday, and make a comment and note about them. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on Marco tonight because each and every time he shares from the Word of God, I hear more of his heart, and it blows me away. And um, I would encourage you guys to come on Friday nights and be blessed uh, because you see a guy pull his heart out and pop it on his pulpit. And, man, I'm, just, I'm so blessed the Lord's using you. And, uh, you know... And I know you're a knucklehead like the rest of us, but, you know, that's why he has to do it. And that's awesome. And you recognize that, and that's good. Keep recognizing that. Um, just to let you guys know, once we're done with Leviticus, uh, then I'm going to take a break from the Torah because, again, there's a lot of, and then Deuteronomy's got a lot of that too. So I'm going to take a break from the Torah, and we're actually going to do an overview of the book of Revelation on Wednesday nights, after we're done with Leviticus, before we move on to Numbers. Next year? What? No. No, because I'm, I'm hoping I can pick it up and, like, hit three chapters. Some of it, I, I you know. So, yeah, really. Yeah, totes. Huh? What? What's he saying? Oh, let's start a pool. Yeah, you do that. Um, okay. Uh, let's see, what time is it? All right, we've got five minutes, so thoughts, questions, comments, input, prayer requests? Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, uh, personally, um, I, you know, just uh, again, um, and I know there's some scriptures, uh, especially in Ezekiel and some in Daniel, that reference the time that is coming in this. And I think, I want to say it's Ezekiel that actually talks about the reinstituting of the temple, right? Yeah. Right. But with all of this and every one of these circumstances and, and knowing what it means when this temple is instituted, if it is the institution of the temple, which is spoken about here, and it is done however it needs to be done to be effectual according to the scripture, because I think they could fake it. You know, they could kind of just make it happen, but not really be doing it when it happens. Because, again, 
a lot of Christians give to the Temple Institute. They want to see the temple be built. And if that's something that God's putting on your heart, you know, hey, you go ahead and do that. But the fact is, is you're you're giving to something that that and it's going to happen on God's timetable. It doesn't matter how much money we give to it. We could give a billion dollars to it and they could have every item of the temple ready, but it ain't going to happen until it's time. And when it does, the Jews are going to be slaughtered by the millions. I just want you to understand that, you know, because a lot of us think, you know, oh, it's going to be God's timetable. and He's going to do it. Yeah. And people are going to be slaughtered, you know, possibly into the billions before the Great Tribulation even comes about to pass as things begin and begin to go that direction. I mean, they're being killed by the thousands now. Jews, Christians, you know, and yes, there are many others of other faiths that are being killed. I want to say it's funny because if you, I went, I was on MSN and they actually had where they took, uh, where a Buddhist, uh, I want to say it was a, was it a Buddhist? Or no, it was like a Tibetan monk or something like that. Um, and, and, huh? Yeah, well, yeah, it's Buddhist, but, you know, it was a specific sect of Buddhism. And he was a monk that was in this, in, in I can't even remember the country, but it was a country that's normally safe. But they killed, uh, they slaughtered him. Uh, they killed, um, I think it was India. Uh, they killed some um, others of the Indian faith. What is it? Uh, th- they killed some Sikhs. And then the very last thing that they mentioned in the least amount of detail was a bunch of Christians. That was pretty much it, right? But the thing is, is, is people are being slaughtered all over. Um, the atheists are bringing it up, which is simply another form of faith and belief. Um, the atheists are bringing it up as, as proof that we should get rid of all religion, which you can't. Because anything that man comes up with is religion. Um, they're even beginning to say now in scientific circles that there is no such thing as free will, that we are simply walking by our design and our DNA, um, therefore freeing them up from any consequence or guilt for their choices and behavior. Well, but that's where they're kind of coming to. They're actually the form of atheism and, and, and existentialism that they're getting into, even though they don't call it existentialism, they say that it's actually science. But in getting into that, they are literally getting to a point where science no longer has any moral boundaries. So the whole idea is whatever you do, it's supposed to happen. It's almost, it's almost an eighth. It's, it is a religion, but it's almost an atheistic fatalism. It's like whatever happens is predetermined to happen biologically. You see, it's all religion, man. It's all religion. That's why we don't need to hold on to religion. We don't need to do anything but, you know, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It's all Jesus. Um, but, yeah, I kind of think when it happens, it's going to be terrifying. Um, and that's one of the things we'll kind of cover when we get into the book of Revelation because I've been looking at some things and looking at some other teachers that I feel are relatively safe. Uh, and, um, I, I mean, once you start getting into, uh, you know, once you begin expositing those things, um, it, it becomes kind of a spooky place to be because we can become fixated on it and, and forget what it's supposed to be reminding us of. Because, I mean, even when John wrote it, these guys were dying for their faith, you know. Whereas if I pay for a conference and don't get what I want, you know, oh, man, they didn't have their crumpets like they had last year, and I paid more, you know. And they were going and saying, ha, ha, we got almost beat to death for Jesus today. Wasn't that great? That's a real switcheroo there in our faith, isn't it? So uh, I, I really, I, there, I, dude, I almost pray that God is doing something politically in this country. There is a part of me that says, Lord, let the persecution come. You know? It's coming. Start start winnowing it out. But anyway, uh, we can pontificate all night. Anybody? Huh? God bless Texas. And all the weather it's got, Marco. You know you love it. There will be a time where you will stand out and you will watch a lightning storm and go, this is beautiful.